Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Chair Moody, I appreciate the amendment. I, a lot of emotion in, in, in what we do in every day, but with regard to this amendment, it's particularly emotional. Uh, you know, please tell us why this, in many instances, is a personal you know, decision to have this kind of discussion, because I know it affects us all. It, it does, and sadly, it's likely to impact more of us in a more profound way in the near future. But for me, after what happened in El Paso, and then being asked to travel to Uvalde, I distinctly remember a couple of the family members noting that I was from El Paso. And they said, you know nothing's gonna change. What's different? What's gonna change? And I told them that you have to have hope or you shouldn't be in this business. I promised those families, just like I promised those in El Paso, that I would fight every hour, every minute, every day that I was in this body to address safety. And I still have that hope today. And I am still fighting today because that was my promise and will remain my promise. And, and part of our job, I mean, there's so, so much is not known. Oh, people think we come here, we push a button, we propose legislation, but every single day we're trying to figure out ways to advocate for our constituents and people that we love and, and those that live in this great state. And that's all you're doing with this amendment is, is, is finding opportunities so that we can be heard and have a chance to, to have this discussion and have this vote and make a policy choice. That's what this is about, right? This is a policy discussion that deserves to be had. And there are many ways to get there. One of the ways is to bring in amendments to the floor, and that's what we did today. And I tell you, it seems like a lifetime ago already, but just earlier this week, uh, when the substance of this amendment was voted out as a bill, um, I took note of something. I've been around the families from Uvalde for near on a year now. Not once before that day had I ever seen any one of them smile. Not one of them had I seen shed a tear out of anything but sadness. Not once had I hugged them and felt that there was some hope and warmth until that vote. Those folks deserve this conversation and they deserve to have that hope going forward. And there's, and, you know, with regard to this amendment and what you're seeking to accomplish, what, what concerns me as a body is we try to narrowly focus on this issue of being, you know, a right to bear arms and what we are talking about is responsible limitations that because of your advocacy and many others and because families have not given up and have transformed their mission to say we're not going to let this tragedy define us, we're going to continue to, to make change. Uh, this is really just a sensible solution to prevent future acts of mass violence, don't you agree? Absolutely. And, and Mr. Martinez-Fisher, the point you raise is exactly what I've been trying to talk to folks about for a long time. We talk all about rights, but never about responsibility. That's what this amendment is about, being responsible. And let me be clear, had this been law last year at this time, those teachers, those kids would be alive today, full stop. And so it's, I mean, it's, it's listening to you say that, I can't even see you. I just have a vision and an image in front of me in my mind, in my heart, about a very sad day that we will never forget. You don't even have to live in Uvalde. You don't even have to live in Texas. Uh, if, you have a, if you have an internet signal, you know, I was looking at 
some coverage about mass violence and semi-automatic weapons. I mean, it's, it's coming up in foreign languages about things happening in this state, and, and it is about responsibility. And I think that, that that mindset hopefully is changing. I hope that today on this vote, we're not voting on whether we have arms. We're voting on whether we want responsible ownership, which I think is what your amendment does. This is a very narrowly drafted change in the law that Mr. King has worked on for months, understanding the litigation that's pending, understanding how you have to be nuanced when you, when you regulate in this, in this space. It is as narrow as it possibly could be drawn. It takes into account every exception, every concern that was brought to his office. And so why can't we have this discussion about responsible gun ownership? The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Speaker, move to extend. Representative Martinez Fisher, for what purpose? Move to extend. Members, you heard the motion. Is there objection? The chair hears none. Motion to extend is granted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, chair Moody, just picking up on the conversation, uh, what, I, what I also fear for, what I'm fearful of is just sort of the continuity and the repetition of weapons like these being involved in mass violence. And, and, and I want your opinion, but in my, my assessment is that you read an article about uh, a mass violence and it's very quick to point out uh, who was the shooter, who were the victims, and then right next to that is what kind of weapon was used. And I, I worry about that as a trend that now it almost seems like it's part of the story that those three items are always in the top paragraph. The names may be different, location may be different, maybe a different city, but the one thing that's always consistent that there was a semi-automatic rifle involved in these mass violence events is, do you see it that way? Yeah, I mean, that, that's certainly been the trend in the recent past. And these are, um, these are weapons that can do an extreme amount of damage in a very short period of time. And when you marry that with youthful folks that have no supervision, like the attacker in Uvalde, who, by the way, made attempts to purchase before he turned 18 and was thwarted every turn. Every turn, he was thwarted. So our law worked. For those people that say laws, you know, only the good people follow the laws, that, that's, that's presuming that there's, there's this bizarre world that bad guys operate in that we don't operate in. If there's impediments in the world, they exist for all of us, not just some of us. And this is the concrete example of how our laws do work to thwart bad actors. In this case, once the impediment was removed, a massacre occurred. And, and help me, because I know, I guess part of the counter argument will be, well, if you, you don't have to be 21 to serve in the military and hold one of these rifles and use one of these rifles. And, but you have to be 21 to buy beer. And, and, and so, you know, help the body understand the rationale that we have such a high bar for the purchase and consumption of alcohol, but we have such a low bar for a semi-automatic, an automatic weapon. You know, I've, I've, I've heard some of the discussion around that. Uh, I certainly think that um, you know, we have an obligation to be as responsible as we can be. And we have, part of the reason why you have limitations on, on alcohol and things of the like is the effect that it has on that individual is, is young, when they're still developing, their brain's still developing, the body's still developing. The, the, and you've seen this in other conversations about other substances as well more profound impacts, and so you want to expand that out to a higher age. Um, we know the brain science here, too, and, and, the, and the behavior of people that are of this age group. And so when we're talking about a lethal weapon and one that can create very significant damage very quickly, uh, I think the treatment should be uh, at least similar. Now, you did raise the issue of, of being in the military, and I think, you know, Mr. King uh, was very clear that if you are in the military and that's the decision you've made, which is a brave decision to make, uh, we're, not, we're not going to impede you with this 
amendment. This amendment would not impact you one bit. So if you are bravely making that sacrifice and are being on the front lines, then this wouldn't apply to you. Right, and we and that was a conversation with Chair King. I mean, I know their members were milling around, and, and you know, it's the last day to pass bills, so everybody's busy. But that that was the that was the essence of the discussion. That we're not. This amendment is not an attempt on somebody's hunting rifle or or to to put some across the board age limit. Uh, you know, please tell the body one more time. I mean, what what is this amendment and the and the narrow limitation here? No, I mean, when you distill it down, with all the exceptions that we've discussed. What the core of the amendment does, it says someone between the ages of 18 and 20, when totally unsupervised, can't go and purchase a high-powered rifle by themselves. That's it. 